The following program is made possible by friends and partners of the Quick Study Television Ministry. Thank you for your support. The fear of God is a good thing and necessary to keep us sane. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. This is the Quick Study Television program taking you through the Bible in one year. From our headquarters at Bible Discovery TV, get out your Bible guide. If you don't have one, stay tuned. We'll tell you how you can get one as we continue to study the Word of God. Part of that study is Cosmic Mysteries with Ryan. Ryan? Well, today I continue my discussion with the author of Alien Intrusion, Gary Bates. Today I ask him why he took up an interest in aliens. Okay, we have aliens on the program today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, we have Gary Bates talking about aliens <laughs> right. on the program. Bible Archaeology with Corey Hembry. Corey? Okay, Kiriath Jerem, the city where the Ark of the Covenant was kept for many years. And then we're also going to be taking a look at a little site called Kerbet Kayafa. It will help us establish the days of David. It's going to be very interesting as we uh, rediscover the kingdom of David, which many deny. Uh, but we have a lot of archaeological evidence mm -hmm. for it. All right, we have the BibleDiscoveryTV.com challenge. Here it is. Who was Chenaniah? Was he a doorkeeper, a blower of trumpets, or was he in charge of the music? Okay, Corey, they are all official positions they in are. the temple. In fact, there's a special name for the doorkeepers, but that's not a hint. I'm just making a comment. I understand. The, of course, the <laughs> BibleDiscoveryTV.com question is all about teaching us about the reading today and helping us to remember the details. Very important. Let's study on through the Word of God. Here we go. In modern society, we celebrate free will. We like to call it liberty or freedom. But what we celebrate should be carefully guarded. The world as we know it today is filled with death, disease, violence, war, greed, and starvation. These are all free will choices. You see, this is not the kind of world that the God of the Bible created. What then created evil in this world? James chapter 4 in the New Testament reminds us all that all violence and war comes from personal selfishness and greedy free will decisions. Liberty or freedom to choose how to live also includes the freedom to choose lust and selfishness, which destroys the world and all the people in it. Genesis chapter 3 teaches us what happens when we choose to lose. Chronicles chapter 13 is a retelling of the history of King David that we read about in the book of Kings, uh, taking the ark from Kiriath Jerem, trying to take it from Kiriath Jerem up to Jerusalem. Right now, you and I are going to explore this ancient city of Kiriath Jerem and even talk a little bit about the modern city that now sits on the same site. The ancient city of Kiriath Jerem first appears in the Bible in Judges chapter 18. Its name means city of forests, and it is here that 600 fear-inspiring warriors from the tribe of Dan made camp. It was so memorable in Israel's history that the area earned the nickname Mahanadan, or Camp of Dan. Fearful circumstances seem to be a theme for Kiriath Jerem. In 1 Samuel 7, it is this city that agrees to keep the Ark of the Covenant when the enemy Philistines returned it. The Ark had just been the cause of chaos in the Philistinian cities, and even to some Israelite men who had disrespected it. 
Here, the Ark stayed in the home of Abinadab for 20 years, until King David tried to move it to Jerusalem. Due to a faulty, unlawful carrying system, a son of Abinadab ended up dead, and more fear ensued. Kiriath Jerom's days of housing the Ark were finished. Kiriath Jerom was also known as Kiriath Baal, meaning city of Baal, and Baala, residence of Baal. Baal here can be read with its common usage meaning lord or master, instead of as a proper noun which would refer to the Canaanite god Baal. Today, historians identify Kiriath Jerom with modern Abu Ghosh. The modern city is named after its founding family. While it no longer houses the Ark of the Covenant, it does contain some historic gems. During the Crusader period, Abu Ghosh was mistakenly identified as Emmaus, the city that resurrected Jesus stayed after appearing to two of his disciples. Sometime around AD 1140, a church was built to commemorate that event, and it is still in use today. You know, it is common in today's society to work very hard at doing what you feel like doing, and then when that violates someone, pretend like you didn't know. Sin by ignorance is blissful and hope for the rebellious, but the problem is God is not mocked. You see, in a world which is more than 8 billion Bibles have been sold and published, over 7,000 languages it's been published in, it is increasingly hard to claim ignorance of God's Word, isn't it? Now, this is a lesson that King David of ancient Israel knew well when he attempted to move the Ark of God, not paying attention to the Scripture. The first time, his great praise and worship party resulted in somebody dying. But now in chapter 15 of 1 Chronicles, David shows as a man who knows the Word of God. This is very interesting. First Chronicles 15, verses 1 through 12. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. Then David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites, of the sons of Kohath, Uriel the chief, and 120 of his brethren, of the sons of Merari, Isaiah the chief, and 220 of his brethren, of the sons of Gershom, Joel the chief, and 130 of his brethren. Of the sons of Elizaphan, Shemaiah the chief, and 200 of his brethren. Of the sons of Hebron, Eliel the chief, and 80 of his brethren. Of the sons of Aziel, Aminadab the chief, and 112 of his brethren. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests, and for the Levites, for Uriel, Isaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab. He said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 through 12. We have a saying in television production, when we uh, were trained uh, in live television, I did live television for many years of my life, and we'd put everybody and get it ready, we'd be live in front of millions of people, and if something goes wrong, we, we'd say it this way, you burn and you learn. <laughs> That's how you learn, is you get burned. And uh, there's a lot of people that could say that for a lot of different reasons, but today, the Chronicles fills in what the Kings has left out. As we move into the book of First Chronicles, the Chronicon, if you would, of David's kingdom, we learn something about David. Remember the first time that David wanted to move the ark. 
and he was all emotional and God was excited and he was excited. He thought for sure God would, would just want the ark wherever he was and God blessed him. So whatever David wanted to do was okay because after all, God made him king and blessed him. But David found out that God's word is higher than the emotions of the king. God's word is higher than the emotions of desire, our desire. God's word is supreme. And so when they moved that ark, a man called Uzzah reached out to, to, to study the ark. The Levites weren't carrying it. It was being carried by an ox cart, which was a mistake. He touched it and he was killed, struck dead. But now we see a different David in 1 Chronicles 15, 1 and 2. Look at this. David built houses for himself in the city of David. And he prepared, he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, and this is what David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. David burned and he learned. You see, there is no substitute for it. Knowing and honoring the power of God's presence is the fear of God, and the fear of God is good, and it preserves life. The fear of God comes uh, as we depart from evil. We do that by faith, and we do that by hearing the word of God. And so David understood. He was burned by that experience, humiliated. And yet God now teaches us, uh, shows David rather, and David becomes a teacher. He's the one telling them, here is the procedure of God. He now knows it. Verse 3 begins, and David gathered all of Israel uh, together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place which he had prepared for it. Well, then David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites, verse 5, the sons of Kohath, Ariel and the chief, he was the chief, and uh, 120 of the, uh, his brethren, verse 6, of the sons of Meriah, and of course, Isaiah the chief was there. And the 220 of his brethren, he was the son of Gershom, Joel, and he was the chief of that particular clan. And 130 of his brethren, of the sons of Elizaphan, and Shemaiah, the chief of the 200 of his brethren. Verse 9, of the sons of Hebron, Eliel, the chief, uh, and uh, the 80 of his particular brethren, of the sons of Aziel, and Aminadab, the chief, and 100 and 12 of his brethren. Look at, look at this, look at this. It brings us to the second power connection. Honoring the leaders and the pastors, uh, well, God has placed into a spiritual authority, brings the favor of God. David had learned that God had certain people and certain responsibilities. And David, the king, learned the king wasn't supposed to do everything. The king wasn't to take all the glory. The king wasn't to be the corpse at every funeral, the bride at every wedding. But the king was, had a role with God, but the priesthood had its role, the elders had their role, and the prophets had their role. And God has an order to things. And so when we build superstars today, whether on television or in church pulpits, that is a mistake. That is breaking the second commandment, creating idols. And beloved, God will bring them down. And we've seen that in the past 30 years in television ministry. The minute idols come up and people begin to worship men instead of God, those idols are brought down low. I'm going to tell you, they come right on down. And so, beloved, God loves his church too much to allow idols in the public square like that. David knew that. And he appointed these men. And he brought the Levites in. He had figured it out. And he realized, you know, this God has a way of doing things. And his way is to not have it, one man have all the power. But his way was to spread out the various roles and responsibility in the spiritual headship. By the way, that's why we see uh, elders in heaven. And we see the beast. And we see elders. And we see angels in heaven. And God has Three types of creatures around his throne. Very interesting. By the way, that's a comment also on the Trinitarian God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But let's move on. Verses 11 and 12 of 1 Chronicles 15. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priest, and for the Levites, for Eriel and Aziah, Joel and Shimeah and Eliel, and also Aminadab. And he said to them, listen, you are the heads of the fathers of the house of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord of God of Israel to the place that I have prepared for it. This is stunning. 
Here is our third power connection. Supporting the spiritual leadership God has anointed always brings the favor of God. Whether you're a business, a businessman running a business, whether you're in an economic situation, whether you're in government, beloved, may I say to you today, when you support the spiritual moorings of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, God will look upon your institutions with favor. I challenge you, businessmen, support your church and support the work of the Lord. People have problems accepting the Bible's historic account of King David, just how big his kingdom was. They like to say that he was more of a tribal leader, that the cities really weren't walled cities or fortified cities. But now there's a new site making waves. In 2007, excavations began at Kerbet Kayafa by archaeologist Yosef Garfinkel, who claims he wasn't setting out to find King David. But that's exactly what he believes has been revealed. The ancient city dates to the 10th century BC during David's reign. Much to the chagrin of scholars who dismiss David as more of a tribal leader, excavations have revealed one of the most impressive fortified cities of biblical times. The walls are estimated to have stood six meters high and still stand two to three. Its walls were casemate, meaning double walls, and made of huge boulders. Only covering about six acres and holding a population of perhaps 600 people, this city was a type of guard against David's western enemies, the Philistines. A most telling discovery is that this city had two gates, which so far is completely unique. This has lent intriguing support to the theory that this is Shearaim, a city associated twice with David in the Bible, and its name means two gates. The location and dating of Kerbet Kayafa fits neatly within the biblical record. It seems as if David's kingdom is more like the Bible's description than skeptical scholars would like to admit. Yet still, the intrigue isn't over. In 2008, an ink inscription on a pottery sherd was discovered at the site. It is the oldest example of Hebrew writing to date, and it records an ethical point of view advocating protection for orphans, widows, and foreigners, and enabling the king to accomplish such things. It does not quote scripture, but it parallels so closely passages in the Law and Prophets. This shows that David's kingdom was not only established, but supported scriptural thought with a literacy level that proves books of the Bible could have been written in this early period. What does the day of the Lord actually mean? Is it one day, an entire age, or is it both? Join the Quick Study Ministry team, Rod Janice and Corey Hembry, as they investigate the Bible term, the day of the Lord. This unique video investigation will explore both the beginning day of the Lord, along with how it's used in the end of the Bible. Also, another hour dedicated to the worldwide reports of the loud trumpet blast and strange sounds emanating from the sky is included. Is there a connection between these strange sounds from the sky and the day of the Lord? Does the Bible speak of these things? And if so, what does it say? This DVD is available for an offering of $10 or more. If you write P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150, with an offering of $10 or more, we'll be happy to send it to you. In Canada, you can write to Quick Study, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Or you can simply go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and get your DVD on Strange Sounds from the Sky and the Day of the Lord.
part of our studies take us not simply to the pages of the Bible, but to the sky. Here to help us understand more is Rye the Science Guy with Cosmic Mysteries. Well, over the past few weeks, we've got to sit down with Gary Bates and ask him a few questions about creation and evolution. But today, we really move into his specific field. That, of course, is aliens, UFOs, and this sort of phenomenon. Today, I ask him why he took up an interest in this particular field. You know, a lot of people have a fear that if they say that they believe in the Bible, what we commonly, uh, particularly the Genesis account, we call them young earth creationists. I prefer them to call them biblical creationists because we're actually just accepting what the Bible says, believing what the Bible says. They're worried about being regarded as fringe. And uh, so, you know, I find myself uh, actually even at the pointy end of that fringe element because my specialist subject is dealing with the alien and UFO phenomenon. And this is something that I had an interest with uh, from a young age. I was uh, deeply influenced by science fiction. Uh, you know, I wasn't, a, a, say, a science fiction junkie, more of the, the popular style, but it fitted my belief in evolution because quite simply, if evolution occurred on the Earth, when I look out in a 14 billion year old universe, which is what I was taught and accepted as a result of uh, uh, the evolutionary perspective of the evolution of the cosmos and the Big Bang, then you know, there could have been alien races out there that might be a billion or a million years older than us. And if they're a million or billion years older than us, they could be so far advanced in their technology, yeah, it's just a piece of cake for them to build their hyperdrive spaceships and visit the Earth. And so I had no problem in accepting the idea of aliens. But one of the things I remember watching a movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, and that movie was made by Steven Spielberg. It contained the research actually uh, of, uh, of two scientists by the name of J. Allen Hynek and, uh, and Dr. Jacques Vallée. And in the end of the movie, Richard Dreyfus walks aboard the spaceship with these highly evolved, benevolent, uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrials. I remember thinking, how lucky is he? You know, going off to a better world, you know, probably there's no death and there's probably all this advanced technology and people don't get sick anymore and, you know, everybody loves one another and, and they're, the, they're the types of benefits that an, an evolved or advanced civilization could bring us. So what I'm really pointing out there is it actually had a religious effect on me. So I started to think, you know, there is an evolutionary connection to science fiction, as I mentioned, life on other planets evolving elsewhere. And I knew how influential science fiction was, and I thought, well, here's actually a great way that we can reach people with the gospel by showing the evolutionary connection to science fiction and tapping into it. So when I started on my research, that was actually my original aim. And as I got deeper and deeper and deeper involved into this, uh, I started to realize that uh, ufology, as it's called, the study of UFOs, uh, was in fact huge. And now NASA and other organizations are searching the heavens under their origins program to look for extrasolar planets. These are planets that might be outside our own solar system. And maybe if they can just find that right planet, then maybe they might be able to see life in the process of evolving, you know. So, you know, mainstream science now is spending literally billions and billions of dollars uh, in this particular search. And uh, most people in my experience, even most Christians, probably wouldn't have a, pro a problem with accepting the idea of extraterrestrial life. But in fact, if we, uh, if we start with the Bible first, it would actually destroy the gospel of Christ. And that's the big problem I have with it. Gary, of course, has done an enormous amount of research on this particular topic. Where can you find this research? Right here in this book called Alien Intrusion. If you'd like to get a copy of it, then you've got to go online to creation.com. It really is an excellent and well thought through book. And Gary Bates, of course, is the president and CEO of uh, Creation Ministries International USA. And they have a special conference coming up in August of this year, 2012. And you should go to creation.com on the United States side and check that out. All the announcements are going to be there. But a lot of good research done on aliens, abductions, and that sort of thing. What it really is from Gary Bates, Alien Intrusion. Very good. All right, so we have the Bible Discovery TV Challenge. We do, and it's not about an alien, but it is a question, who was Chenaniah? Was he a doorkeeper, a blower of trumpets, or was he in charge of the music? What do you think? You know what, I don't really remember, but I'm going to commit myself mm -hmm. to 
the music. He's the, the third one. What was the third one? In charge of the music. In charge of the music, yes. In charge of the music, that one. He was, in fact, really in charge of the music. <laughs> See, I was <laughs> trying to hint earlier in the <laughs> program when I said doorkeeper. Yes. I really is. I'm just, you, you really were just giving. I was an just giving a piece of information okay, that had right. nothing to do with it. So, First Chronicles 15, verse 22, will will let you know that Chenaniah was in fact in charge of the music. In fact, music <laughs> was a very serious thing. It was, right? it was indeed it was in the ancient tabernacle. It was that first post of music was that of the ministry of God's word. Today, of course, we've turned it into an entertainment medium. Uh, I think the ancient Hebrews would be quite upset with what they see in our present society, what we've done with Christian music. Uh, but in the days of David, it was actually the Levites who sang, and they had instruments. David made instruments that were only to be used for the worship of God. They did not belong to the musicians. The musicians left them at the temple and went home, and then they came back and they left them there. They never left the presence of God. And those instruments were consecrated. They were only designed to be blown by the Levites who blew the breath of God's praise into those instruments as a symbol of creation. That according to a Jewish tradition. Very interesting stuff. <laughs> Let's carry on as we continue on in quick study. You know, a lot of people are afraid of God for the wrong reason. I was thinking about that the other day. A lot of people are afraid that God's going to, you know, strike them with a lightning bolt or something and hates them. And God doesn't hate you. That's not what the Bible says at all. God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave. He gave, he gave his only begotten son as Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, why did he die on the cross? For your sin and mine. You see, Something's wrong in the world, terribly wrong. Sin's in the world, and it's, it's affecting all of us physically and emotionally and spiritually. That Jesus died on the cross to free us from that sin so that we can have a new life and, and not be bound by our sin. And then he rose again on the third day so that we could have eternal life. And although this life will someday end in a grave, but my spirit will be with Jesus Christ because I've accepted him as my Lord. Will you come to Christ today and accept him? And pray and say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again. I accept you as my Lord. Help me today. Oh, he'll come. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study as we go through the Bible in one year. Today on the Just Thinking Bible Study, exclusively at our media headquarters, BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Our subject is self-proclaimed prophets. There's a special punishment for those who say they're prophets of God, but they are not. Join us today.